طابت اوقاتكم اود ان اتشكر المركز العربي and it's uh, very enjoyable very very interesting i'm learning a lot so um, <coughs> my to- our topic uh, uh, lorenzo hanawi and, and myself our topic today is the european energy crisis as a second front of the actual hot war that's taking place in ukraine so uh, we all know the 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 history of this, uh, the 2014 initial invasion and the 2022. Um, I'm just going to give some background. This, this issue came up uh, yesterday a lot, so I thought a, a little bit I'd mention, um, you know, what is this war about in the grander scheme of things? And I think um, ever since around 2007, it was quite clear with the speech Putin gave at Munich um, that Russia had rejected joining the liberal democratic European order. Russia had been invited by Europe and by the United States to join this order, and it was clear at that point they weren't interested. Um, Russia wanted to escape being, how they, how they would see it, a rump state with all the former Soviet republics taken away. Without this, without especially what was considered as a buffer, buffer states in USSR time, Ukraine, Belarus, and Georgia especially, um, there's no way that Russia could be a superpower. And I think this has a lot to do with what motivates uh, Mr. Putin. Now, what means, I'm, uh, I'm happy that we could talk about that much more, just very quick, okay? But the question is, in order f- to achieve these aims, what are the means that the present-day Russia has? Of course, we know there's military aggression. There was 2008 in Georgia, 2014 in Ukraine, and again in Ukraine. And we know that's not going very well for Mr. Putin. But the other thing is the weaponization of energy. And this is, I hope to show you how this has been a uh, long-term weapon in progress that's been thought about actually since before Mr. Putin came to power, Uh, but at least 20 years, 22 or 24 years in in present Russia. The weaponization of energy. Um, Russia still, when this war began, was still an energy superpower. I don't think anyone considered a military superpower aside from the nuclear weapons. And it can use this to try and split off. The whole idea of the energy war is to split the Europeans amongst themselves and against, against each, the countries against each other and their societies and to undermine the support for Ukraine. Okay? Um, so I'm going to talk about gas, and I'm not going to talk about oil. I would love to talk about oil. I worked on oil for a long time. Just If you want to ask me about it, I have opinions about that whole other side of things, but I'm going to focus on gas. Um, so Russia, since at least 2000, was deeply involved, mostly with German leaders, in building um, these detour pipelines, I call it, Nord Stream 1 and 2, and there was also this Turk Stream around the south of Europe. I'll show you why I call them detour pipelines in a moment. It reworks the exports to the, United, to the European Union that used to go through mainly through Ukraine or through Belarus and Poland. It reroutes them around the north and the south. It's a huge infrastructure project. It's one of the biggest infrastructure projects in European history, if you look at it together. Um, Okay. So here's a a map of the uh, European pipeline system. And so uh, initially, the gas that flowed in Soviet times came through these pipelines here, as I said, across Ukraine and Belarus, um, and Poland as well, to some extent. And these countries here. Now, because Russia has certain designs on those countries, um, in order to preserve the business of Gazprom, should in the future there be um, uh, those countries be disrupted or invaded or whatever, it was necessary to build new pipelines. And this started around 2000, a pipeline system around the north, the North Streams, and then there was some uh, there was some controversy about what route it would take, but it ended up being Turk Stream around the south. And so by these water routes, it completely avoids any states that used to be dominated by the Soviet Union, okay? So that transit is cut out, and that's the new transit. Here's the ones across the top. Nord Stream, you see, is completely in the water, arrives here in Germany, from, directly from Russia, no, in, no involvement with these other former Soviet-dominated countries. Initially, the plan for this pipeline around the south was to come into Bulgaria, but the EU stopped that in 2015 on the basis of the third energy package, the uh, legal basis that it wasn't transparent. 
And uh, so this is the change. Can you see it? Uh, the route was changed. There was an agreement made with Mr. Erdogan, and the pipeline went through Turkey instead. And now, all through this period, the Russian side and the Germans who were their partners would say, this is not geostrategic, this is just business, and various explanations, okay? Um, and so it would say it's not geostrategic. So um, a, a diplomat friend of mine, we were at uh, this conference in uh, Berlin, uh, 2019, and the, the deputy minister of energy of Russia is speaking, explaining why they're building the pipelines. And he says, we're building these pipelines here to avoid zones of conflict. And these are the countries he considers zones of conflict, which is exactly what I just told you. Okay, So this is how the Russians also looked at it, frankly. Um, so the Russian strategy was this rerouting. And well, I'm not going to talk about this in detail. I'm happy to answer questions. But there is this question that always comes up, especially in Europe, as to why is it that the Germans supported this program? And they decided to put their individual uh, energy security above the security of, of Ukraine, I would say. Was, and this was a failed policy. So, and, and this was opposed by other states in the EU. It was a very lively debate in the EU on this question. So with the military front failing in, 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 inside Ukraine, this becomes very important that Moscow has to split the supporters and it, on the basis of energy. They have, as, as um, my colleague was pointing out in Arabic, they have certain advantages in this in that Europe is so over-dependent on Russian gas. And Europe has failed, especially Germany, but Europe to build alternative infrastructure. And there's some poor planning with renewables that took place no storage. It turns out that if you have no storage and you have 30, 40 percent renewables, what do you do when the wind doesn't blow? You turn on gas turbines. So gas actually was becoming more geostrategically important because of the move towards renewables. This wasn't well thought out, okay? Um, so um, this, of course, was something I would say the Russian side understood very well, the vulnerabilities, okay? Um, so in the long term, as my colleague had pointed out, in the long term, the transatlantic alliance can replace all the Russian oil and gas. There's no question there's enough reserves in the world of oil and gas. There's the finance, there's the technology, there's functioning markets, whether it's gas in Qatar, gas in the United States from fracking, oil in many places. But the infrastructure, and the, it takes time. So it's going to be a matter of years. And in that short run, that's when Russia has a great lever over Europe. So I'm just going to show you the extent of the dependence. So I go back to just pre-corona, which was sort of a typical year, how things were, okay, and how they would have returned eventually. Uh, so this top part up here is the EU production that EU produced itself, about 42 percent. This is the pipelines from Russia, about 41 percent of their imports at that time. And the rest is from other non-European pipelines, Algeria, uh, LNG from Qatar, so forth, from the United States. So you can see the heavy dependence on Russia. I'm sorry. now. The EU production, if you look at that EU production, that's where it was going. It was going down. So that meant the plan was to increase the red stuff, okay, the, increase the stuff from uh, Russia on the base, on the understanding, very strong a point of view uh, from the Germans in particular. I, I'm in Berlin, so I hear this all the time, is that LNG was just too expensive from Qatar or from the United States, the Poles, for example. And the United States would argue strenuously, but you get a security benefit from that investment, and you can buy spot at times. And the and you know and the countries that did that actually got to re, like Poland and Lithuania had offshore terminals. They were expensive, but the Russians actually voluntarily gave them a cut in the price because it was competition, and they paid for their terminals. So you know anyway, but Europe didn't do that. Now those countries were all going down. Norway was staying about the same. Gazprom. It was this, this is the Russian dependence, and there was you know, some potential in the future, and I, I have explained that. So that was the situation. Now that's been cut. There's some still flowing across Ukraine, some in Turk Stream, but it's essentially cut. Now what do you do? So the EU, EU I just want to, as I go through this, let you know, the EU has not put sanctions on Russian gas. They also made a carve out together with the United States, you can pay for Russian gas. It, according to your contract in, in uh, euros or dollars, you can pay for it. So the idea that the Europeans have cut this 
as Mr. Putin repeatedly says, it's just not simply not how it's happened. The EU did say that they do not trust the Russians anymore and they're going to move away and they have a plan for moving away, but they didn't break the contracts by refusing to take delivery. So Putin knows his time is limited and if he's going to weaponize something, this is the time to do it before that replacement comes. So uh, this is, uh, it's sort of like uh, we have soap operas in the United States, you know, these complicated stories that change every day with different heroes and heroines. It's sort of like that, this story. Um, but before the war, Russia was already weaponizing the gas supply. And just to say very quickly, in uh, 2019, there was a glut of gas because of pandemic. In 2020, 2021, it was very cold in Europe, and the wind didn't blow, and there's an overdependence on wind. So that gas was all used up, almost totally used up, to make electricity. Putin, knowing what he wants to do in Ukraine, excuse me, says, aha, their storage is empty. This is a lever. And so it turned out he didn't send from March of that year, he didn't send gas. Now, my research at the time showed that he was making like the gas godfather. If you connect Nord Stream 2, I'll give you gas. You could get it if you connect it. And making this threat, but looking into it, talking to people who were working in Russia at the time, said, our storage is empty too. <laughs> he has to fill our storage. So he actually didn't have extra gas. He only had extra gas around September, and then he didn't send it to Europe. Instead of that, he shut down the flows. And so he worked as much as he could to keep the storage as low as possible before last winter. But last winter, all I can say is we were lucky. It wasn't so, you know, the wind blew and it wasn't so cold and we got through without a crisis. So he's playing the same game again this winter, but this winter, um, what, what happened uh, in, uh, in that previous winter is he cut off the spot gas. The spot gas mainly came through the Yamal Europa pipeline across Belarus and Poland. He cut that, but the contracted flows more or less continued. So the next stage of this was he started uh, this past, just before this winter, he started to cut gas flows, but they have a problem. If you're gonna cut the gas flows, there's long-term contracts. He's gotta claim force majeure, or he's gonna owe a lot of money. He'll be taken to arbitration court, okay? And he'll be liable, and all gas prom property can have liens put on it. So huge billions of property, pipelines, um, storage facilities, uh, refineries, even ships could be seized in the long run. So he had to be careful. In retrospect, I'm not saying this was completely obvious at the time. So at first, he demanded rubles. It wasn't very legal and so forth. He said, if you don't pay in rubles, you've broken the contract, but this didn't really hold up too well. He cut some countries off who wouldn't pay rubles, but there was even any paid in rubles, and he still cut them off. So that, you know, obviously, that's not something you use for force majeure. Then he has this whole drama about the compressors on Nord Stream 1, a, com a, a line that's been running since 2011, never broke, and suddenly all the compressors are broken, right? And said, oh, I can't take the compressor back that was repaired outside the country because of sanctions. The German chancellor stood in front of it, said, here it is, please come and take it, and they wouldn't come and take it. So, and Siemens said, this is baloney, it's not true. Um, we can fix those compressors online. It, it's, it's not, so there goes the force majeure. So he totally cut the gas flow because he's preparing for a gas, you know, for an energy war this winter, he's desperate, but he needs an excuse. Well, it's quite interesting what happened next. Somebody blew up the pipelines, right? And uh, so this is an unambiguous force majeure. He can't send the gas, the pipelines are broken, which leads me to think who blew up the pipeline, right? And who would have the tech, it's obviously a state. It's obviously not some divers, it can't be done in that way. So it's obviously a state, it's you know, quite, to me it's quite clear it's the Russian side who did this. And what's really telling each pipeline, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2, Nord Stream 2 never came online because he was weaponizing gas and there was an agreement with the Americans made by Merkel that that guy, pipeline wouldn't come online if he weaponized. So that's not certified. Nord Stream 1, he blew up both, both the strings are blown up, but only one string of Nord Stream 2. Who would blow up the pipelines and leave one string? Everybody knows that that pipeline, the Poles and the Eastern Europeans, the uh, the Baltic states, Ukraine, the United States, absolutely they didn't want that pipeline connected. They felt this was a betrayal of the Europeans' interest that the Germans were involved in. Now the Germans are under tremendous pressure to 
to approve the certification of that pipeline because Putin is saying, I was allowed, there's no sanctions, I was allowed to send gas through Nord Stream 1, so let me send it through Nord Stream 2. So it makes the maximum, during the winter when the gas is low, this will make the maximum dispute as companies go bankrupt, turn it back on, and again, are the Germans working with the Russians? It'll, it'll create the maximum uh, tension. So it's an interesting, I would say, tactics. Um, okay. Um, so uh, there's been a lot of, dis I can't really get into this too much, but the whole struggle now of the European Union to desperately get gas. Um, and we know who are the, the players who can provide it, USA, Qatar, Norway, Norway Algeria, so forth. There's, very, there's been very active American diplomacy on this. You know, the Americans had discovered through intelligence well before the war began that it was going to begin. My understanding is not only did they warn the Ukrainian government and the Europeans, they actually warned the Chinese as well. And it's not clear if the Chinese actually believed them, but it's very interesting that the Americans were warned what the Russians are doing. I would have been interesting to be at that discussion. <laughs> okay, so. They've been trying to uh, do diplomacy to help further this. Um, and uh, there's a lot of diplomacy, as you know, between Europe and Qatar. Also, the Germans are interested. And um, let's see. These are the difficulties. Uh, I, would, I, I think the, what I'd like to focus on in my few minutes is, I, if coming from Germany, it's, it's a microcosm of some problems. It's more, fo more concentrated than, than the rest of Europe. I'd say there's ideological and political problems. There's unrealistic ideas about how fast the transition to so-called green energy should go, that it's even possible to have 100% renewables without nuclear energy, and to cut out fossil fuels so quickly, I think, is unrealistic when there's no storage and so forth. So we have a problem in Germany. Exactly as the energy war begins, who becomes the captain or the general of the energy war is our energy minister. An economics minister It's the first time the Greens got the position. So it makes perfect sense to leave perfectly safe nuclear power plants online, but he'd get thrown out of his party if he did, does this, right? So he had to allow the chancellor to force him to leave them online, okay? So I think there's a similar problem in the negotiations coming to Qatar and other countries for LNG. Two minutes, okay. Is that um, uh, it's difficult for a minister in that position to agree to contract, say, over 10 years, because the promises in 10 years are supposed to be carbon neutral, right? So why don't you promise that in 10 years, this gas that we're buying will turn into hydrogen? Well, that's not, I don't think that's very realistic. So the, somehow, I under, the, obviously, the Qataris, but also the Norwegians warn them, and also Americans who need longer-term contracts because of the investments involved, okay? Now, on the Qatari side, there's also these ideas of destination clauses, which are clearly against the law in the European Union as a whole, and the Germans can't do anything about that. Um, and that was actually a law put in there against the Russians putting destination clauses. So when somebody comes and talks about destination clauses, it should be understood this raises issues of what we were fighting with the Russians about, right, uh, for a more liberal market. So these are things, hopefully, that can get sorted out. Um, so I just want to say what could be done by the GCC on this. Obviously, you have a long-term possibility of new gas relationship with Europe and oil relationship with Europe. And hopefully a more realistic view of how natural gas in particular is part of the transition for a long time. The other thing um, I would point out, I don't know, a year ago today I was at, uh, the ambassadors here from Ukraine, I was at the first annual uh, Ukraine Gas Investment Congress. Now, given the strategic situation, there weren't a lot of investors there. <laughs> but I realize they have good, they have resources, reasonable resources, not high rents you're not going to get, but it can produce, and this is a matter of sec national security for the country. You know, people will make money. So it's just a suggestion. Since other investors don't want to take these risks, and also since, um, uh, since there are bars on various public banks making investments, if Qatar or the other GCC countries were the first to move to make an investment, say, in the west of the country, and to invite to match other countries that came in, this would be seen very positively in Europe, and I imagine in Ukraine as well, and help them maybe get their industry move, this moving. It's a suggestion. So, thank you. Th thank you. Thank you, very much. Mr. Lawrence, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence.
Now we'll continue our uh, uh, today a very interesting, enjoyable meeting. Uh, our uh, second uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Ayhab Saad. Ahlan uh, Usan, Mr. Ayhab. Said Ayhab, the Hagiga Indu Waraka, Benwan Tathir Azmat Ukrania, Fitavahum. Titled Impact of the Ukrainian Crisis in inflationary matters and uh, he is an assistant professor at Doha Institute. He got his PhD from Michigan University in 2014 and previously he was assistant professor at Bir Zayt University. His research interests uh, focus on liberating local markets and the impact of that on renovation and uh, innovation and uh, also the economic integration between the Middle East and North African regions and today he will be talking about the impact of the Ukrainian crisis on inflation in GCC states. And also, he use the data available to examine the situation with the inflation in GCC states and to understand the impact of that first and also to isolate it from other impacts like the corona pandemic and uh, Mr. Ayhab also will try to understand the situation of GCC in comparison with other countries and uh, finally he will conclude by what the Gulf countries are doing to mitigate the impact of the crisis. We have 20 minutes. Thank you very much for inviting me. When the organizers invited me to speak about the war in the Ukraine and its impact on inflation, the first reaction was, oh Lord, Everybody wants to know about inflation because it is the talk of the hour. Everybody wants to know about it. And it's not necessarily easy to tackle, to try and understand the reasons and causes of inflation is difficult enough without being in a war situation, let alone if you're dealing with it in the context of a war situation. I'll do my best to uh, to discuss with you, will, does the war in the Ukraine have an impact on the GCC countries from the point of view of inflation? If you want a quick answer because you want to leave the room, I'll say, look at the map and then you can go. <laughs> you see, this is the a map of inflation. The darker the color, the the higher the the inflation rate is. In the black areas, it's over 25%. In the lighter colors, it means it's a, it's a less serious situation with the, the green zones indicate one to 5% inflation. I got this map from the IMF. It's clear that the Gulf area is green, which means that the inflation rates are not that high in comparison, except for the UAE, which is purple or red. This is because it's 5.5% or, and even though it's still less than Europe or the United States, where in some cases between 8% eight, eight and over. So a quick uh, reply to your question will be no impact, no inflationary impact on the war uh, on the GCC countries. But let's delve into some more details. Uh, we, in Qatar, we, now we all live in Qatar, 
I decided to look at Qatar because we live here. And from September 21 to September 22. If we look at the yellow line is the annual uh, using the consumer price index. The dotted line, discontinuous line, is the monthly rate. It's clear that even before the war, the war started here, February 2022. So there was an upward trend. It was difficult then to say what impact the war had because there were already inflationary pressures because of the pandemic. So it seems that there is a high annual rate of around 6%. But uh, it's, it doesn't seem that the direction has changed. If this is the monthly rate, it doesn't look as if it was Im impacted more. January, February, uh, it went down, then it went up again. So there has been some impact, but it was probably less than what we had expected. Of course, this doesn't necessarily mean that there was no impact at all. The yellow line, the figures I just gave to you, is the inflation measured in consumer price index. Uh, this is uh, uh, except housing, electricity, water, and uh, other household expenditures. If we exclude that, then we will see that the annual rate there is about 5% if we excluded the electricity, water, and other, some types of fuel and household expenditure. I wanted to focus on accommodation because maybe part of the inflation or the 6% inflation rate in Qatar is due to high accommodation costs or some foodstuffs, because we know if there is an impact of this war on the GCC countries, it is likely to come from two sides. Oil prices, because of the rise in the oil prices, because Russia was a primary supplier and supply was disrupted. And the second thing which will have a direct impact is the price of food and foodstuffs because we know both Russia and the Ukraine are uh, amongst the basic suppliers of foodstuffs. It's, well, if we look at the figures here from the period after the start of the war, there has been some change, a rise. Uh, in the food prices. Also in accommodation, there has been uh, also water and electricity in 2022, there's been a rise. And this is also difficult to say whether it's due to the war or is it due to other reasons. We know Qatar is hosting the FIFA World Cup in 30 days, and maybe this had something to do with the rise in the cost of accommodation and not necessarily linked to the war in the Ukraine, specifically when it comes to the cost of accommodation, water and electricity and utilities. If we leave aside the figures, because the figures do indicate that there is an impact, although it's not very high, and also, in the, from a theoretical point of view, we can say that uh, the war can have an impact on inflationary rates in the world, first of all. Let's look at that, then first focus also a little bit on the Gulf. So far as the world is concerned, of course, uh, through the pro, uh, pro, production, and production is disrupted because of uh, war, and this will uh, uh, impact the supply, and that will have some inflationary impact. Also, the disruption to the supply chains 
And of course, this was impacted, but although it was present before the war, it started with the COVID pandemic. Uh, uh, also, the impact on production and the supply chains and the impact of that on the supply side of the economy. Maybe another cause can be the rise in the cost of uh, transportation, uh, also land routes and sea and routes and air freight routes have had to be changed and also the geopolitical risks. There was a noticeable rise in the concerns of investors who, and this had an impact on investment, for example. This is from a global point of view and is not necessarily applicable to the GCC countries. The question we want to ask, the problem this paper is trying to address is, does the war in the Ukraine have an impact on the GCC? And if so, is it different than the way it has impact, it's been impacting the world? So how can uh, the war in the Ukraine impact one country more than Another. I think we need to focus on certain aspects. First of all, the direct economic exposure. Uh, by that, I mean the size of the trade exchange between the country concerned and Russia and the Ukraine. The more the country is exposed, it will be impacted more, whether to do with inflation or any other aspect. The second uh, point is the geographical location, the closeness to the area of the conflict and like questions of uh, refugees, uh, internally displaced people, also the spillover of uh, the conflict itself or the polit all its political aftermath and consequences. The final point, which I think may have something to do or may increase the impact of the war on a certain country, is the political exposure. The more stronger or closer the political ties between the country concerned and the Ukraine or Russia, this will raise doubts and um, the hinder the readiness of investors to invest in that country. So therefore, these points can increase or decrease the impact of war. How can we classify the Gulf countries? So this is the contribution I can make in this paper is based on this. If we look at the Gulf countries, I chose three, and I apologize for not including the others. We have Qatar, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and the UAE. Here we see the percentage of Qatari import from Qatar. So, uh, sorry, from Russia. Only 1% of Qatar's imports in 2021 comes from Russia. Less than 1%, about half a percent is from the Ukraine. In Saudi Arabia, the figures are similar. Less than 1% from Saudi Arabia's imports come from Russia or the UAE. The same almost applies to the UAE. Their import from Russia is just above 1% of the total percentage of imports the, from Russia from U, UK is 0.2% of the total imports. So therefore, the direct economic exposure in these three countries